morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to guest speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Paul J. Brockelman, who will speak on individualized treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma. A very warm welcome to all the delegates and faculties for spending your valuable time today. I must thank Dr. M. B. Agarwal, sir, for giving us an opportunity to participate in today's webinar. So before we proceed, I just want to share a few slides of Adley Oncology. So now we are one of the leaders in ceratoxic segment, having our own manufacturing facilities. So overall, we have four ceratoxic facilities, which includes one API facility also. So we are truly a backward integrated oncology company. And thanks that we got a wide nation wide uh, acceptance for our Ultrombo pack and also, we are working on NDDS formulation, NIPS, and PARP inhibitors. In next four years' time, we'll be launching around 13 molecules in hematology. So, at least expanding globally, now we are available in more than 40 countries, and we have got uh, majority of the accreditations. And here are a few brands we are in. We are into the leadership position. I am glad to share with you that very soon we'll be launching Kylonip. That is a brand of nilotinib, 200 mg and 150 mg capsules. Thank you so very much. Now I will hand over the stage to Dr. M.B. Agarwal, sir. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for setting the ball rolling. Good morning to everybody from India and whichever other country you belong to. Our guest speaker this morning is Dr. Paul Brockelmann from Germany. He'll be lecturing on individualized treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group, supported by Adley and managed by Perfect Square. I thank Mr. Ashutosh Shukla and the team from Adley, Mr. Yash, Mr. Kalpesh and team from Perfect Square, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our chief guest of the day, Dr. Krishna Kumar Ratnam from Madurai. Our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Brockelman from Germany. All our discussions were themselves eminent hematologists or hemato oncologists. New participants were sparing your Sunday morning, afternoon, or evening, depending upon which part of the world you belong to. To introduce you to the webinars next weekend, on Saturday, 9th September at 7 p.m. IST, Dr. Joseph Corey from Nebraska Medical Center in Nebraska will be speaking to us on plastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm. And next Sunday morning, 11.30 a.m., our own Dr. Subhaprakash Sanya will be speaking on how do I diagnose and treat invasive fungal infections in hematology. He's from Fortis Group of Hospitals. Our discussions today are very important personalities from various parts of India, and uh, we have Dr. Aditi Shah, KM Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Advait Bore from Nanavati Hospital, Ville Parle, Mumbai. Dr. Akshay Shah from Nanavati Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Amit Khurana from Akanksha Hematology Center, Surat. Dr. Ankit Batra from Cancer Research Institute, Dehradun. Dr. Asha Shah from Nanavati Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Balakrishna Padate from Nanavati Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Bharat Bosle from Raheja and Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Bhavna Parik from Bombay Hospital, Lilavati Hospital, Hinduja Hospital, Bharti Aruginidhi Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Chandrakala S. from GS Medical College, KM Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Dharma Chaudhary from Sanar International Hospital, Guru Gram. Dr. Girish Kamath from SDM College of Medical Sciences, Harvard. Dr. Gunjan Lone from Vokad Hospital, Nagpur. Dr. Manoj Toshniwal from MGM Medical College, Sirko, Aurangabad. Dr. Narendra Kumar Chaudhary from Ames, Bhopal. Dr. Pankas Tantia from Acharya Tulsi Regional Cancer Center, Bikaner. Dr. Parthiv Mehta from Jeevandeep Hospital, Bhavnaga. Dr. Raghuvendra Rajesh Shwarkar, Solapur Cancer Center, Solapur. Dr. Rajasekhar Thiruk Nanam from Kowai Medical Center, Hospital, Coimbatore. Dr. Rohit Pai from HCG, ICS, Kupchandani Cancer Center, Neriman Point, Mumbai. Dr. Saikat Datta from Bansal Hospital, Bhopal. Dr. Shruti Toshniwal Mantri from Aurangabad. And Dr. Sham Agarwal from Navode Cancer Hospital, 
Bhopal. Our guest speaker for the day is Dr. Paul Brockelman. He is hematology oncology consultant, Department 1 of Internal Medicine, University Hospital of Cologne from Germany. After graduating from University of Cologne in Germany in 2013, he started working as a clinical fellow in the Department 1 of Internal Medicine of the University Hospital of Cologne under the supervision of Professor Halleck. He's abroad. He is the board certified consultant in hematology and medical oncology, also in general internal medicine and in, in, and in emergency care. His clinical focus are hematological malignancies with a focus on lymphomas, as well as management of toxicities from immune checkpoint inhibitors. Simultaneously to his clinical training, he became an active member of the German Hodgkin's study group with Professor Andres Engert from early 2014. He conducted parts of his hematology oncology fellowship as a visiting physician in the lymphoma unit of Sloan with Professor Ennis Yunus in New York. He currently works as hematology oncology consultant in the Department 1 of Internal Medicine at the University Hospital of Cologne. As an active GHSG physician, he has led multiple investigator initiated clinical trials with the aim to improve outcomes of patients with classical Hodgkin lymphoma by incorporating anti-PD-1 antibodies both in the first line and in the lab setting. Currently, his main goal is to further individualize the Hodgkin lymphoma treatment by exploring response-adapted anti-PD-1-based first-line treatment, focusing on the first-line setting and older patients. To this end, he is actively performing translational research as a physician scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne, Germany, with the aim to dissect Hodgkin lymphoma biology and mechanisms of response and resistance to anti-PD-1 as well as immune-related toxicities. He's a member of American Association of Cancer Research, EHA, ESMO, and German Lymphoma Alliance. He's the author of over 60 peer-reviewed publications, including publications in JCO, Lancet Oncology, Annals of Oncology, Lancet Hematology, Blood, and Leukemia. He will be lecturing on individualized treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. Before he does that, it's my privilege to introduce our chief guest of the day, and that's my friend, Dr. Krishna Kumar Ratnam from Madurai. He's senior consultant, head of the Department of Medical Oncology and Bone Marrow Transplantation at Minakshi Mission Hospital and Research Center, Madurai. His educational background includes MBBS from Tamil Nadu, Dr. MGR Medical University, 1996 to 2001, MD General Medicine, Manipal University, India, 2003 to 6, Dear Medical Oncology from Cancer Institute at Diyar Chennai, Tamil Nadu, Dear, uh, Dr. MGR University, India, 2007 to 10, DNB National Board of Examinations, India Medical Oncology, 2012, FRCP Royal College of Physician of Glasgow, 2020, Diploma in Health System Management, Darden School of Business, USA, 2021. His academic credentials include University Topper and Gold Medalist, MD Internal Medicine 2006, Kasturba Medical College, Manipal University, Mangalore, Karnataka. Institute Topper and Gold Medalist in DM Medical Oncology 2010, Cancer Institute, Adhya, Chennai. University Topper and Gold Medalist in DM Medical Oncology, the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University 2010. Received Best Doctor Award from ECAM Foundation 2013. Principal Investigator for Network of CLJ Nickel Trials India, funded by National Biopharma Mission by BIRAC Government of India, has many research publications in peer-reviewed international and national journals. I request him to inaugurate our today's webinar and give us some words of wisdom. Over to Dr. Krishna. Thank you, Professor Agarwal and the Mumbai Hematology Group Executive Committee members and our uh, speaker of the day. This is uh, a privilege to be a part of uh, today's meeting and it's a privilege to be in any of Professor Agarwal's meetings because it is usually the choices of the topics that uh, Professor Agarwal picks up. 
and india as a country is populous not just for uh, the population sake but even if the numbers of the hematological malignancy may look a little less compared to the solid tumors which are there in the oncology the hematological diseases have a unique character that they are aggressive at presentation but the good point is many of these diseases when uh, treated well are curable and given our population the absolute number of these diseases are quite high and as hematologists and hematologists ourselves i think everyone will agree with me that hodgkin lymphoma is something very dear to all of us and this is a prototype cancer if we want to uh, motivate any student or a post graduate to move into hematology for their uh, super specialty and graduation and practice and i am so happy professor agarwal has picked up this topic for a beautiful sunday and i am even more happy that we are all students till we go to the grave and we have a wonderful faculty with us professor ball rockelman from germany who has come all the way to educate us and in turn educate all the students who are under us and it is my privilege once again and i thank uh, uh, professor ragarwal the executive committee members of the mumbai hematology group and all the academicians out there for giving me this honor to inaugurate this meeting and now i will step down and i will go back to my student status to listen to professor paul rockelman thank you professor ragarwal thank you dr krishna kumar for sparing your sunday morning and inaugurating this webinar you will be with us for the best of ia in couple of days and uh, now we are uh, moved to dr paul brickelman uh, we have already introduced you just couple of minutes ago uh, only thing i did not mention that you will be personally here in mumbai in january towards the last week and that time we will have all all of us will have a great opportunity to interact with you personally today we will hear you in the part of the web meeting and over to you you can share your screen go ahead with your subject yes uh, thank you so much and actually i'm very much looking forward to see all of you um, in person uh, beginning of next year i'm going to share my screen and just um try to highlight some context um regarding individualized treatment of hodgkin lymphoma and as you can see this is something that is really i think important to uh, as our colleague uh, krishna already said uh, to all of us uh, and i'm going to follow this agenda which is basically uh, focusing on first line setting first and then looking at relapse and refractory hodgkin lymphoma if we remember the bi biology of this disease we can acknowledge that there is classical hodgkin lymphoma divided into four subtypes for example nodular um, sclerosing hodgkin lymphoma um wait a second just trying to get some uh, some highlight huh? so nodular sclerosing hodgkin lymphoma mixed cellularity lymphocyte depleted or lymphocyte rich hodgkin lymphoma and all of these entities have in common that they have very few malignant cells which are usually CD30 and uh, pd like and one positive. And they have um, yeah some very uh, immune cell rich microenvironment. And this is what characterizes the disease. In nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, it's a bit different. Um, the malignant cells are usually CD20 positive. So that's, uh, to my opinion, a different entity and I'm not going to focus on this today. I'm trying to focus on individualized treatment um, in these patients by risk certification. And one can ask, why do we do that? And in my opinion, it's important to do that because if we treat Hodgkin lymphoma individualized, we can see that each patient um, is uh, yeah, cured with the least necessary treatment that is required for this individual, individual patient. And by doing this, we can do 
um, focus on pretreatment factors uh, for risk stratification and upfront individualization. And I think the we most well established ones are clinical risk factors, but we see increasing interest in metabolic tumor volume, but also circulating tumor DNA. And in the future, we are going to see uh, radiomic features and gene expression profiles and an integrative analysis of something like this uh, to basically stratify our patients. If we look at this on treatment, so on the fly, while the patient is treatment uh, treated, we can see the PET status, for example, the VILS score 1 to 3 as PET positivity, or uh, something like change of metabolic tumor volume, change of ctDNA, something that we know as MRD negativity in other hematology cancers, is increasingly important. I will focus on established risk factors uh, herein, so mostly on uh, PET-based uh, treatment certification. We know that there are certain risk groups that can be determined, um, and our risk factors in the German Hodgkin study group, but also in other European or American groups, allow us to certify early stage uh, favorable disease, which is basically uh, limited stage one to two, without any risk factors, early stage unfavorable, the presence of risk factors in the context of limited stage disease, and advanced stage disease, which is uh, stage three or four with the addition of uh, stage 2b and some of the risk factors. We know that is, this is important and therefore a PET-CT-based uh, staging without any bone marrow biopsy is recommended prior to any first night treatment. And from one of our analysis, we know that actually stratifying the patients is something that matters. Because if we have a look at this plot, you can see that um, if you treat patients that are early stage unfavorable with only two cycles of ABVD, their prognosis is quite bad for Hodgkin lymphoma. So the five-year progression fee survival is only 86%, which is uh, roughly 10% less than um, if these patients would have been only favorable risk group. So... In my interpretation, um, stratifying these patients does matter, and it's important that we assign them to the correct risk group. I will focus on early stage favorable uh, initially, and I think the HD10 trial, which was initially published by Andreas Engert in the New England Journal, and then with some prolonged follow-up, uh, this is 10-year data in the JCO, nicely shows that all of these patients do not require four cycle of ABVD or 30 gray radiotherapy, but they are sufficiently treated with only two cycles of ABVD plus 20 gray radiotherapy. So you can easily reduce the number of cycles and the uh, dose of radiotherapy in these patients. In the HD16 trial, which was only recently published and shown at, at international meetings, we can we randomize patients between the standard treatment two cycles of ABVD followed by 20 gray radiotherapy to a PET-guided approach where patients that were PET-negative were assigned um, to only follow-up, so no radiotherapy, and only the PET-positive radiation patients received radiotherapy. In this trial, we can appreciate that um, uh, basically omitting radiotherapy does lead to a decrement in uh, progression-free survival with roughly... Um, 70%, uh, 7 percent less progression free survival if we omit the radiotherapy. This is something that led to the adoption of um, uh, consolidative radiotherapy for patients with early stage favorable disease in uh, Germany. If we zoom in on this, we can see that the VIL score 4 is something that uh, has actually the worst prognosis. So patients with Deville score 4 um, uh, harbor a progression free survival of only 80%. And I think in these patients, it's worthwhile to explore if um, intensification of treatment could actually salvage this bad prognosis. And this is something our European colleagues from the EORTC did. And in the H10 trial, they could show that if you treat those patients with um, uh, two cycles of BioCOP escalated, shown in yellow, the prognosis improves compared to only consolidative radiotherapy. And this is something that's widely done and also incorporated in German um, guidelines. So if patients are PET negative after the two cycles of ABVD, we don't uh, we only irradiate, but if they remain PET positive, we tend to um, escalate to two additional cycles of BIOCOP escalator and then perform radiotherapy. 
in early stage unfavorable disease, so intermediate stage, we um, introduced the more intensive uh, two plus two regimen shown in red, which is superior to four cycles of ABVD. And um, especially after 10 years, still leads to a progression free survival of more than 90%. So if you treat these patients in early stage unfavorable disease with um, yeah, two plus two, you can see that the outcomes are actually improved compared to APVD. So in our HG17 trial, we looked at pet-adapted radiotherapy after this intensified um, systemic treatment, and we could see that if we had randomized those patients, there is actually no difference between those that receive standard treatment. So all patients were irradiated versus those uh, that only received radiotherapy if they were positive. In this case, the non-inferiority margin was excluded, so omission of radiotherapy is feasible without achieving um, inferior progression free survival. I think it's fair to notice that the um, five-year progression free survival in this trial was excellent. There's 59% um, PFS and nearly 100% over, overall survival, so um, this is a very uh, effective strategy. Next, we um, investigated whether first-line treatment with immunotherapy, such as nivolumab, incorporated with AVD, uh, uh, as Nevo AVD, either fully concomitantly or sequentially um, is an effective treatment. Overall, all patients received four cycles of Nevo AVD, followed by 30 gray radiotherapy, and this is something that uh, harbored outstanding results. We recently published the update in the JCO, and um, yeah, you can appreciate that this is not a survival curve, but a survival line, I think, and the three-year progression free survival uh, is 100% uh, in the concomitant group, and only one case of Villiers disease occurred in this trial so far. Importantly, we have very high early complete remission rates of 87 and 51% after four cycles of um, Nevo AVD and uh, a single agent Evolumab. And after single agent Evolumab, there is a histologic complete remission after in 50% of cases. And most of these patients had a reduction of metabolic tumor volume in the range of 90 to 100%. So even if they don't achieve a complete remission, the vast majority of the um, metabolically active tumor um, goes away. This is why we think that with uh, four cycles of Nevo AVD, most of the patients are overtreated, and we hence look at a further individualization with the INDI phase two trial, where we use the antibody um, tisilizumab, which is an investigational NTPD1 anti antibody, to basically see if patients can be cured with only NTPD1 antibody. So if they are PET negative after mon therapy, they will continue with the antibody and uh, also not get any radiotherapy. And um, only patients that remain PET positive will receive chemotherapy and also um, uh, consolidative radiotherapy. That's something that is going to be uh, kicked off in Germany uh, quite soon. So I think over the next couple of months, we will enroll the first patients. Next, in advanced stage disease, uh, which is a very um, challenging topic, we know from previous um, studies, but also from a network meta-analysis, comparing ABVD to various other treatments, mostly Stanford 5, but also escalated Biacop, that escalated Biacop is the most um, effective regimen in these patients, shown in red. Uh, there is significant, significant overall survival and progression survival benefit compared to ABVD. And this is why uh, people in Germany use and people in Europe actually use um, escalated BIACOP as a standard first treatment. In the HG18 trial, we focused on a de-escalation. So patients who initially SG, um, received two cycles of escalated BIACOP were um, randomized to only receive two additional cycles if they were PET negative. And this is something that uh, led to very good results, as you can appreciate from this uh, five-year um, progression with survival curves. The curves do overlap, and it um, is possible to reduce the overall treatment cycle to four cycles of escalated BIACOP compared to six cycles if the patients achieve an early paid negative uh, remission. 
And this is why in our guidelines, we incorporate this um, PET certified individualized treatment of patients with advanced stage disease, resulting in a very short um, treatment of uh, four times uh, three weeks compared to nearly half a year of six cycles of um, APVD. And importantly, um, if there is PET positive residuals after this treatment, uh, patients are irradiated. Internationally, the, I think, echelon one trial uh, led to some uh, very good results. Uh, and in blue, ABVD was compared to um, AAVD or a six cycle of brentuximab AVD. Um, and this is something that uh, led to a significant uh, progression-free survival and then also um, a slight overall survival benefit. But if you have a look at the actual percentage of patients that are cured, you can see that um, uh, the proportion of patients is a bit lower than what we, you would achieve with um, escalated beer cup, and therefore this uh, approach has not been widely adopted in, uh, in Germany. At the recent ICML meeting in Lugano, we saw the dose dense, so DD, dose intensive, DI, ABVD. And this is something our Italian colleagues did and um, where uh, they basically administered higher doses of doxorubicin in ABVD. And they also did a dose dense, so day one and 11, not day one and 15. And this is something that leads to striking benefits in progression for survival. It's again nearly, it's more than 10% compared to standard ABVD, but the overall um, progression free survival remains uh, uh, less than escalated beer cop. But in my personal opinion, this dose dense, dose intensive ABVD is something that is uh, worthwhile to explore, especially in the setting of um, uh, uh, resource constraints or uh, uh, emerging countries. One highlight of ESCO and also also ICML was the SWOC uh, study, S1826. And um, this showed that the one-year progression free survival with NEVO AVD in blue is better than Brentaximab Fidotin uh, and AVD. And if you have a look at all of these patients, we can see that the percentage of patients that uh, discontinued all of the treatment is fairly similar. The um, discontinuation rates are less with nivolumab, so only 10% compared to 20% had to discontinue this uh, targeted agent. And very few, few patients in this trial were um, irradiated. If you focus on um, uh, side effects, we can see that uh, neutropenia was a bit more common in nevo AVD. However, there was less GCSF used in this patient population Anemia and thrombocytopenia were comparable, um, and if anything, they were more common in the brentaximab fidotin arm. And the progression, uh, the the polyneuropo PNP polyneuropathy, was more common with brentaximab based uh, treatment. Importantly, um, immune associated AEs were less common with um, nivolumab AVD uh, compared to brentaximab fidotin. In our own HD21 trial, we um, aimed to basically modernize and optimize BIACOP. So this is how BIACOP is done. It's a very intensive regimen uh, administered at, one, at day one to day eight or even 14. And in the BRCAD regimen, we have uh, days one to three for etoposide and then day one doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, uh, brentaximab fidotin and some uh, oral medication of the carbazine and dexamethanol. And the overall idea is to have similar efficacy while reducing toxicity with the bracket regimen. This was randomized uh, to beer cup and aimed to show a superiority of um, bracket, so the new regimen in terms of morbidity and non-inferiority in terms of progression free survival. That recruited internationally, mostly in Europe, but also in Australia and New Zealand. And um, more than 1,500 patients were enrolled. They were well stratified for any risk factors. And um, first, we could show that the treatment related to mobility with BRCAD, so the new regimen, is better than BIACOP. And this also translates to less erythrocyte uh, tra and thrombocyte transfusions to less PNP less mortality and improved gonadal function as an indicator of um, fertility after treatment. 
If we focus on PFS, we can see that uh, these outcomes are excellent. So the three-year progression free survival estimates are more than uh, 90%. And importantly, the um, curves of Brackard, so the new regimen, appear to be better even than beer cop. So what we definitely can say is that Brickard is non-inferior to uh, beer cop. And we also see a trend towards uh, superiority of um, the experimental regimen um, compared to beer cup. The overall survival in this population is excellent, uh, nearly 100%. And if we focus on the reasons for uh, mortality, we can see that 0.2% uh, of these patients actually died due to Hodgkin lymphoma or treatment related reasons, which is very, very low. So in summary, and this is actually what we showed at ICML, and I will not read it, but we can say that um, HD21 sets a new standard and a benchmark for primary cure rates in Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, due to its excellent benefit risk ratio, we adopted it as, as, a, as a standard treatment in these patients. So patients in Germany and other parts of the world are now treated with two cycles of record, followed by two or four additional cycles based on their PET status. If we now focus on the um, older patients, I think it's fair to say that this is a growing challenge, and especially in um, emerging countries, Manila and De New Delhi as an example um, of some large regions, we can see that these um, older patients actually account for the majority of the incident, and this is also true uh, in parts of the uh, Western world. We can appreciate that these older patients are challenged because they have most of the Hodgkin lymphoma-related re deaths, um, so more than 75% uh, of, of patients that die due to Hodgkin lymphoma are older than 55 of age. If you look at how these patients, patients are treated, we can see that um, in a large um, register-based based study, most um, received ABVD or AVD, and the outcomes with this are relatively poor with only 64% over survival. If you use CHOP, the outcomes get worse, and if you use something else, uh, the outcomes get even worse. So there's a large unmet need in this population, and um, in Germany, most of these patients, and this is from our guidelines, uh, get treated with ABVD, followed by radiotherapy, or AVD without pleomycin, and followed by radiotherapy. And um, this is not really um, yeah, something new or an innovative approach. In large uh, trials, we could see that unfortunately there's no progression free or over survival benefit um, with BVAVD in Echelon 1. We could see that there is um, some benefit with uh, sequential treatment. So, first brentuximab, then AVD, then BV. And we could see that nivolumab and AVD is something that is very effective. And I think it's worthwhile to explore if this could be a new standard of care in these um, older patients. At first relapse, the prognosis is very heterogeneous. We have some patients that are low risk that have a, a better outcome at relapse. We have a large group of um, patients that receive uh, standard treatment. So um, basically salvage plus beam plus autologous stem cell transplantation. And this blue curve results in five-year progression fee survival of 60% in Germany. And we have a very high risk group shown in green and purple that fail salvage treatment and also are of high age. And for these patients, the outcomes in the relapse setting are even worse. If you focus on the low risk group, we can say that um, you don't need to treat them with high dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplantation, but we can treat them with uh, polychemotherapy. So you don't necessarily lead, need to transplant these patients, but you can administer ABVD, for example, followed by radiotherapy and shown in red, the outcomes are not um, inferior to, um, to intensified treatment with the stem cell transplant. This holds true for, for, for progression-free survival, but also overall survival. So in Germany um, and also international guidelines, uh, treatment with stage-adapted first-line polychemotherapy um, is valid in those patients. 
If you want to stratify patients for risk, we can use five easily available um, risk factors. Stage four, time to relapse less than three months, more than five centimeters of bulk, ECOG more than one, or um, incomplete remission to, uh, to salvage therapy. And um, if we do so, we can see that even patients that only have one of these risk factors, shown in purple, have inferior outcomes to, um, uh, to patients that have uh, more risk factors or no risk factors. And this is why we choose these patients to, for example, do brentaximab fedotin consolidation. This was established by um, Craig Moskowitz and published in Blood uh, with the long-term follow-up and shows that if you do brentaximab fedotin for up to 16 infusions, um, this in, in, uh, um, decreases the, the, the uh, likelihood of progression-free survival events. And um, this is something that we regularly do. So if a patient is at risk for relapse, we do brentaximab fedotin consolidation, and we also consider adding radiotherapy to PET positive um, residues uh, around um, autologous stem cell transplantation. Nivolumab and pembrolizumab, two NTPD1 antibodies, have proven very effective in the relapse setting, and the uh, um, phase two trials basically overlap. So the remission rate is around 70%. The median duration of response is around 60%. And if patients achieve a CR shown by the top curves, we can um, appreciate that the progression of survival and overall survival of these patients is very good compared to those that don't achieve a response. The concept of uh, treatment beyond progression is very um, well established. So if patients have radiographic progression, they can be kept on the agent. So they continue NTPD1 treatment. And if they do so, the prognosis is better um, compared to patients that uh, don't to treatment beyond progression. And in my personal personal opinion, opinion uh, or and, and, and experience, many patients uh, continue treatment beyond progression with these agents. And this leads to very good five-year overall survival, especially patients that achieve remissions to the disease. Complete remission patients uh, have an overall survival of nearly 90%. But also patients who have partial remission or stable disease um, have very favorable overall survival compared to patients that um, don't achieve remission. Importantly, you can stop nivolumab if the patients are in complete remission for more than one year because patients sustain their complete remission or have complete remission after re-exposure. It might be worthwhile to consider low-dose anti-PD-1 treatment. So this is a, a Russian trial, actually, who in, investigated 40 milligrams of nivolumab and uh, could show very nice response rates and also um, nice progression-free and overall survival in these patients. So from an economic perspective, it might be worthwhile to um, decrease the dose of nivolumab. And lastly, nivolumab proved um, effective versus brentaximab fedotin in a randomized trial. So with nivolumab, the overall response rates and the progression-free survival is better than with brentaximab fedotin. And um, nivolumab was um, approved, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, excuse me, uh, pembrolizumab was approved as a um, new standard of care uh, in patients who are not eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation and who have had two uh, or more treatments. If you combine uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab with conventional chemotherapy, such as GVD or ICE, we have the PGVD or NICE treatments that lead to a very good um, uh, progression-free and overall survival and might be an alternative to conventional chemotherapy to induce remission prior autologous stem cell transplantation. Our own group will look at... Um, omission of, um, of uh, consolidative transplant in patients who have a CR to pembrolizumab ice. And we will investigate um, a cross uh, uh, non-cross-resistant switch to pembrolizumab DHAP uh, in patients who don't have uh, optimal response. And this pilot trial aims to investigate whether or not we can actually omit um, consolidative transplant in these patients. Lastly, um, it's worthwhile to explore further checkpoint inhibition. So patients might express PD-1 and you might block it, but they have, could have an other antibody such as TIM3, LAC3, TIGIT, and so forth. And these checkpoints might lead to circumvention of anti-PD-1 efficacy. And if you block them, you can uh, actually achieve a remission in such patients. 
This is done in various trials and we participated in the phase one, two MK4280 trial and uh, one of our young patients with a lot of um, disseminated disease received combination of pembrolizumab and Antilec-3. And um, actually it's achieved a very nice remission which lasted nearly a year and only thereafter had a very slight progression of the her disease. She went on to um, allergenic transplantation and in the end achieved a complete remission that is ongoing. And um, the phase uh, three trial of this combination is actually um, recruiting patients right now. Uh, to conclude my talk, I want to summarize uh, the, the, the current recommendations for individualized treatment of uh, first line Hodgkin lymphoma, first showing the um, early stage favorable risk group, so stage one, two, without any risk factors, where patients are usually treated with two cycles of ABVD followed by radiotherapy. If they are PET positive, you can consider escalating to escalated BACOP, and in the older patients, the treatment regimen is the same. In patients with intermediate stage disease, so stage one with risk factors, uh, we have uh, the two plus two regimen and radiotherapy is PET guided. And in older patients, we use ABVD or AVD. And in the advanced stage setting, as I showed you, we use a break for two, uh, for four to six cycles overall um, in a PET adapted fashion. Older patients are treated with A or ABVD. And um, with that, I would like to very much thank you for your interest and also conclude my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul, for that wonderful review and all your research work. Uh, it was very stimulating. We have our colleagues over here. They will probably like to interact with you and ask some difficulties, questions. So you can open your videos. You can use the raise hand sign and we'll have some discussion. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind uh, feedback. I'm looking forward to uh, to any questions. Yes, Dr. Shyam, go ahead. Uh, Shyam, you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, sir, and good morning, Dr. Paul. Uh, I'm Dr. Shyam Agarwal from Bhopal, and uh, like to. I cannot start my video. Anyway, yes, now it's fine. So uh, I have a case like uh, 25 years young uh, boy, which presented with uh, generalized lymphadenopathy with B symptoms. And the patient uh, had a PET scan stage 4 disease, bulky disease in the right inguinal region. And then... Uh, he had uh, CD20 positivity in the IHC. Uh, so it was a nodular lymphocytic predominance case. Uh, we uh, did a PET scan, as I told, it was no bone marrow involvement. So it was treated with the RAVVD, four cycles. And after four cycles, there was a residue in the right inguinal region. And uh, so... Uh, the, he had a DVT also in the uh, right femolar uh, vein. So there was a lot of swelling. So radiotherapist said we should wait for the, you know, this to subside. And uh, we continue with two more cycles of AVVT. He became PET negative after six cycles. And uh, uh, after three to six months of last cycle, we did a PET scan again. It showed a... Uh, 2.5 centimeter rounded single lesion in the uh, left lung. We biopsied it and it came out to be diffuse large B cell lymphoma, non Hodgkin. So, uh, like uh, my questions are uh, what is the next management? Uh, whether uh, this is a common phenomenon, I never had it. Like it was the first time in my life to have Hodgkin's converted into non Hodgkin's. And uh, like, uh, what is the prognosis of this such boy? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, that that's a very nice case, I think, to discuss. And um, it's quite typical. So you describe a case of um, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, NLPHL, yep. which is CD20 positive, and you uh, yes. you do the the correct treatment in my opinion right so you treat it with rituximab based abvd yes. um, you achieve the remission 
you could have gone for early consolidative radiotherapy because this disease is very very sensitive to radiotherapy. However, okay. it often transforms to aggressive non-Hodgkin B cell lymphoma. This is very similar to what we see with follicular lymphoma, for example, and um, that's something that is the natural um, cause of this disease. So you can't avoid it, but you have to do a rebiopsy, and it's good that you did this and you confirm that it's aggressive B cell lymphoma now. And in my opinion, what you need to do now is try to treat it very intensively. So ideally some salvage chemotherapy, something like DHEP or ICE or whatever is available to you. And then ideally perform um, autologous stem cell transplantation after high dose chemotherapy. Um, in Germany, we might even consider um, treating such a patient with CAR T cell treatment. However, um, I think uh, Without CAR T cells available, you might go for um, uh, salvage chemotherapy, high dose chemotherapy, and uh, consolidative transplant. The key takeaway, in my opinion, uh, for for the community is if there is PET positivity after treatment and uh, it, it, it starts to grow, especially in non nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, you should do a rebiopsy just to make sure um, you are with what disease you are dealing with. Uh, that's very important, and um, it's good that you did this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So nice, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gore. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Agarwal, sir. Uh, Dr. Paul, uh, I have a patient who's uh, a second who's relapsed post uh, autologous transplant and is currently undergoing Nevo with brentuximab as a combination. And he's had this for about nine to ten months now, and we've been discussing about stopping therapy maybe going on to low-dose NEVO because cost is becoming an issue. You showed us some data about stopping the treatment and patients remaining in CR after completing one year of uh, nivolumab maintenance. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Is this would be very relevant in this young boy who actually wants to go abroad and continue his studies. Yeah, um, again, very nice question and also good um, uh, treatment approach. I did not show the efficacy of combination NEVO and uh, LPG, but um, that is a very effective regimen and you can achieve a complete remission with it. And question um, uh, So what you can do is uh, if you have achieved a complete remission and um, there's no active disease, you should stop the brentuximab vedotin, I think, because it does not add anything except toxicity. You could consider continuing nivolumab at a low dose just to complete one year of treatment and then also uh, discontinue nivolumab and just monitor the patient. If there is some active disease left, so there's a good remission, but some pet positivity remains, you could add some localized radiotherapy to it um, just to get rid of this one or two lesions that remain pet positive. And uh, in our experience, uh, you are able to actually achieve durable remissions and patients remain in this remission once you discontinue this treatment. So um, the chances are not bad that if you discontinue nivolumab and brentuximab, the patient remains in remission. If this is a very young patient and um, you might want to have a durable durable cure for this patient, you might consider uh, to do an allogenic transplantation. And um, that's something that we increasingly do in Germany because we have good experience with it, especially after uh, checkpoint inhibition. There is some concern in terms of GVHD and some immune-related toxicities, uh, but if you have some washout phase of a some weeks, one or two months, um, then you can safely do the allo transplant. And uh, if this was my patient, I would consult him uh, to do allogenic transplant to maintain the remission. Because if you just stop treatment, you might be lucky and he might be in remission. But if he's young, you might also lose a window of opportunity where you can do a transplant and cure the patient. Uh, and this is something you need to discuss. That's, that's I think, important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Gori. Dr. Asha? Asha, unmute yourself.
Okay, we'll go to Dr. Bhavna. Uh, good afternoon, and first of all, uh, I must thank the professor for an excellent overview of uh, Hodgkin's disease, and uh, I'm really happy to know a few facts about the disease. Uh, my question is that that uh, when we see the patients in relapse, and they are elderly patients, about the age of 60, already treated, say, a few years back when they were more fit, and now they have either a cardiac illness or rejection fraction is on the lower side, or they already have some pulmonary issues, so can you give us some guidance that these kind of patients, how do we go about treating who have some comorbidities with them? Yeah. Thank you very much for your feedback and the, and the question. I think this is very important because in the older group and even in some younger patients, you cannot do um, a lot of intensive chemotherapy, right? Because the, the, the cardiac fun function is bad and... Um, and you need to consider something that is suitable for these patients. And in salvage chemotherapy, so if you, if you have a first relapse, for example, and you can do a lot of different regimens without, without anthracyclines. So, for example, ICE or um, IGF, and um, use these regimens in patients with cardiac comorbidities. Um, High-dose chemotherapy might be a problem, if you want to do it, you can um, uh, do something like uh, high dose melphalan, which we do in multiple myeloma. We have done it in, in a few patients. Or you might, yeah, not do it, not do high dose chemotherapy, but just achieve a remission and try to consolidate it with uh, radiotherapy, for example, to large lesions legion, or pet positive lesions. And consider some some maintenance treatment with bentaximab or um, nivolumab. If a patient is really unfit and you cannot go for any transplant, um, then you need to ask yourself the question: if any intensive salvage chemotherapy makes sense, or if you just um, try to treat those patients with something that is tolerable, such as an NTPD one antibody or a bentaximab pedotin, if it's available to you. Um, sometimes you can also do uh, something like uh, gemcitabine or bendamustine-based uh, chemotherapy. So there's a var variety of options which you need to tailor to um, uh, to the fitness of your patient. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope this this, is, this answers your questions. But this is a very challenging uh, situation, and um, one size that does not fit all. So you need to find the individually right approach uh, in such a patient. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Bhavna. We take <clears throat> one question from the audience. Uh, are there upfront markers to predict the response to nivolumab? Yeah, that's a very important uh, question. And uh, we have been searching for such markers and we have not, not, not found them. So in, in Hodgkin lymphoma, to my interpretation, there is not a good marker to predict response to it. Um, in solid tumors, we know that uh, tumor mutation of burden or um, PD like in one status is predictive, but in Hodgkin lymphoma, this does not seem to be the case. Um, there is some small studies which indicate uh, that MHC status, so MHC1 or 2 expression might be predictive, but this does not really hold up if you look at larger cohorts. So in Hodgkin lymphoma, I think all patients um, should receive this treatment if they uh, they need it and if it's available. And there, to my opinion, is no upfront marker that can stratify or say this patient should not be treated because he does not benefit. Um, and therefore, all patients should get the exposure. And if they benefit, you can um, actually... Uh, Think about how much you need to give them if you want to consolidate with a transplant uh, or if you want to discontinue if they achieve a CR, for example. Uh, but briefly, there's no uh, well-established um, uh, marker to predict response to NTPD1 in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Not yet, at least. Dr. Paul, one more question about Nivolu. Is the 40 milligram low dose is as good as the standard dose? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And all these standard doses, they were established by the companies and these companies have an interest in selling their drug. So <laughs> we don't know if this is a good dose. And um, from this uh, Russian study for nivolumab, but also for other cancers, especially solid cancers, we know 
that you can use lower doses and they are effective and they might be as good as the high dose. And um, we have used low dose nivolumab in, in patients who are um, paying for the drug themselves and who have financial issues. And um, as far as I know, the data and my experience, the, the, um, the exposure to low dose nivolumab is as good as uh, high dose nivolumab. And I would rather give patients low dose of nivolumab uh, uh, or any anti PD1 antibody um, uh, uh, in contrast to not giving it to them. So if you have the option and you have, can choose, um, just give them the low dose and it might be as good as the high dose. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Asha, your question. No, we can't hear you now also. Asha, we can't hear you. You just sort that out. Uh, Dr. Parthiv. Sir, my question is, a patient with unfavorable uh, stage 2 classical Hodgkin's lymphoma treated with two cycles of ABVD. On the interim PET evaluation, there is a regression in size and uh, number of lymph nodes, but PET CT scan suggests you have do well a 4. So should we continue with the same regimen of ABVD or we have to change the regimen or we have to biopsy the uptake site? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, I was giving a talk in in, in uh, northern Germany yesterday, and they asked the same question. So that's a very common problem, actually. And um, if the patient is responding, so the lesions get smaller, the will score might get lower for some lesions, but there is some pet positivity. Um, I would consider this a response and just continue with the treatment. Uh, so I would add two more cycles of ABVD and then consider radiotherapy. If the patient does not respond and you have unchanged PET positivity, I would recommend to switch to something like escalated BIOCOP to achieve a remission. But if you are on the right track, just continue, do a PET CT scan or a CT scan in the end and do uh, consolidative radiotherapy um, if this is necessary. Thank you, sir. Okay, again, a related question. In a young woman, uh, if you do not want to radiate the mediastinal area, then what kind of option you have which is equally efficacious? Yeah, um, again, a very good question and something that is challenging. Um, our guidelines are leaving the option to not irradiate those patients or to use modern radiotherapy concepts such as IMRT, um, so intensity modulated radiotherapy or proton radiotherapy, or use uh, smaller doses of radiotherapy. So usually we would do 20 gray in favorable and uh, 30 gray in unfavorable, but you can adjust this. And we know that the cumulative radiotherapy dose, especially to uh, the, the, the breast tissue and also the coronary arteries is something that is very important. And um, yeah, you need to spare those tissues as good as you can. And therefore modern radiotherapy, sometimes even with lower doses might be uh, helpful in such patients. We don't have any good data on it, but we do also, we also in Germany, we do these uh, decisions on a case to case basis, right? We discuss with the patient, we say, look, there might be an increased risk of relapse, but we want to spare you a second cancer and therefore we don't do radiotherapy or we do a lower dose or we do a smaller field. And uh, that's something that you need to discuss uh, with your patients um, or, or simply de decide for them. Yeah. Thank you. Asha, are you okay? Okay, Dr. Sruti, your question. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Shruti, and thank you, Dr. Paul, for a very, very, very interesting talk. I just want to ask if uh, we had a patient of advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, stage four bone marrow involvement, and after two, uh, actually, uh, he was not ready for uh, biogop. So after two cycles of AV, ABVD, he was having pet positivity, uh, but also he had a lung toxicity in the second cycle. So, uh, so what are the options now? And we wanted to give him steroids for the lung toxicity. So after giving steroids, uh, giving Nivo AVD, or uh, again, Bentuximab has lung toxicity, escalated Biocop has lung toxicity. And what is the role of, uh, like how much effective is Nivo AVD after we give steroids or any other, other options are there? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, challenging. 
uh, you don't want to give this patient bleomycin, so you can you could continue with AVD, but if I understand, so without bleomycin uh, and just continue treatment, this is feasible if there is a response. Um, if there is no response and the patient is progressive, you need to switch treatment. And then again, um, you can do BRCOP without bleomycin. That's an option. You can do BRCOT if it's available to you because it's without bleomycin. Uh, or you could simply do it as the American colleagues do and the NCCN guidelines do it and uh, and switch to some um, yeah salvage chemotherapy, right? Something like ICE or um, uh, uh, IGF, which does not have that much lung toxicity. You try to achieve a remission and then consider um, consolidative radiotherapy. Yeah, but if there's toxicity to treatment, you need to get rid of the agents that cause the toxicity. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes. Also, I wanted to know if uh, this uh, steroids, what time should we uh, give a gap between steroids and nivolumab? If we want to use new Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks. That's a, again a good question. So I think the steroids, in my experience, for, for ABVD-related toxicity, they don't help that much. People can people do it, and you can do it, but you, you should not... Um, use it too much and rather try to get rid of it at, at, at one point. Um, and you should not delay any further treatment due to the steroid. So I would rather continue with um, something like AVD or even nivolumab uh, if you just finished the steroids. So um, we have some patients who have received a high dose of steroid or who still receive 10 milligrams of prednisolone and you just start them on nivolumab and uh, that that's effective. So the, uh, the key message is not to delay any further treatment. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Can I add something? Sorry? Can I add something? Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, regarding this uh, use of steroid and immunotherapy, initially uh, we have been using in solid tumors. And uh, initially we also thought that it is a complete contraindication for use of immunotherapy if the patient is on steroids for say, even some of the diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. But now we have realized that uh, low dose steroids will not have much impact on uh, immunotherapy drugs. So I think maybe same thing can be applicable in this scenario as well. That's what I assume. Yes, I I I, I agree to that. Um, so there's no contraindication to use nivolumab or pembrolizumab if you have low dose steroids and. Um, even if you are still tapering steroids or, or reducing the dose, you can continue or start with new volume of treatment. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Narendra. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Paul, for a nice uh, lecture. Um, my, as I am pediatric oncologist, so uh, my question is, uh, what is current uh, recommendation from your side for use of uh, PD-1 inhibitors as well as the brentuximab um, in case of uh, relapse refractory uh, Hodgkin's, pediatric Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. And um, Hodgkin's lymphoma is very common in, in, in children and adolescents. So um, in Germany, our pediatric colleagues take care of this. So I have not really treated that many children myself, but, um, uh, and the data is limited. So we don't really know how effective and how safe these um, agents are in kids. I think the biology CD30 expression, PD Langer 1 expression is very similar. And therefore these agents are likely very effective. And, um, I would use them very similar to what we do in the adult patients because we don't have any dedicated relapse trials for kids and we should just learn from the adults and, and, and use what they do there. This might change when we introduce these agents in the first-line setting because there is a pembrolizumab-based first-line treatment for, for kids and um, uh, you might want to consider this if you do any self-treatment. But for for children that received conventional chemotherapy, such as WEPA or um, COPDAC or whatever you use, um, and they have a relapse, I would uh, strongly advise to uh, first use uh, pembrolizumab because in my opinion, and also based on the, on, on the phase three trial in adult patients, it's more effective than bentuximab. 
it's also better tolerable and therefore I would try to use this uh, eventually in combination with chemotherapy to achieve a remission and um, yeah, consolidate with the transplant because in, especially in kids and younger patients, you want to um, have a curative uh, treatment approach. Yeah. So are you, are you aware about uh, any um, so like best protocol? Uh, we use actually OIPA and POPDEC only uh, for pediatrics. So currently actually we have one relapse uh, patient who got who was high risk uh, in beginning only uh, stage 4a and after uh, two oepa uh, there was uh, good response but uh, residual uptake was there in pet uh, in uh, cervical area in one area only and uh, after uh, four cop deck again pet scan was done in that still there is some residual disease uh, we did biopsy, but unfortunately, biopsy was not representative because the lymph node was very small, only one centimeter. So anyway, we needed to go for uh, RT. So we sent for radiation. While uh, when radiation was started, after that, within five days, there was some progression in the size of the lymph node. And uh, now child is on radiotherapy. So we thought we will just finish the radiation and then plan the next line of treatment. So definitely we need second line treatment. But do you think uh, that uh, pembrolizumab can be added uh, in the next line of treatment? Yeah, that's a good case. And what you are doing, in my opinion, is, is, is correct. And um, I would also finish radiotherapy because it's effective usually in Hodgkin lymphoma and you should use radiotherapy whenever you can. And um, if there is continued progression or still some activity, you could consider just doing pembrolizumab as a monotherapy. I think that's reasonable to do and then see how, how, how the patient does on it. If they achieve a remission, you might want to think about a consolidation, for example, due with a transplant. Mm -hmm. Since this patient has not received autotransplant, you could also uh, start with an autotransplant uh, if there's a remission. And if there's refractory disease or progression with pembrolizumab, you can, um, I think, try to add something to it. Um, for example, some uh, other chemotherapy that with agents that the patient has not received in OEPA or COPDAC, um, uh, something like pembro ice, for example, and um, and then try try to get a remission and then try to do the um, the autologous stem cell transplantation. Yeah, but. Finishing radiotherapy, starting pembrolizumab, up, seeing how the response develops, that's something that is very reasonable to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aditi? Thank you, sir. It was a very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. So my first question is that uh, we had seen two patients of advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma presenting with the florid HLH. So have you seen any such cases and how would you approach them? Yeah, so I can I can answer this first. Um, we have seen it. It's not common, but some patients of advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma have, have HLH. It's a very strong inflammation and they are very sick usually. So they tend to be in the hospital. And um, what we did, and this is off-label and without any data, we just gave them one or two doses of uh, of NTPD1 antibody, uh, pembrolizumab, for example, or nivolumab, and then the HLA uh, went away within days because the Hodgkin lymphoma was under control, and then we could start regular chemotherapy afterwards. That's how, how I treated the few cases that I had. Um, if you don't have access to NTPD1, you can also do something like etoposide, dexamethasone, just to get rid of the, the inflammation and then start chemotherapy. Yeah, we, we we gave dexa in one or two weeks of etoposide and simultaneously started ABVD. Uh, yeah, I think that, that that's reasonable to do, right? Yeah. Um, uh, in our case, the patient was quite old and, and very sick and uh, the, the, the kidney function was bad and therefore we did this... Um, is one or two doses of Pembro and it, it went well. But as I said, it's a very rare uh, situation, but we have seen it uh, uh, every once in a while. Yeah. Thank you. And my second question is that uh, a few months back, we had a young, around 35-year-old male with end-stage renal disease who presented with advanced-stage Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
So how would you approach this patient in terms of treatment? Yeah, I mean, I, I only briefly showed it. And I think um, this is a talk on its own. Uh, older patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, because it's very challenging. There's emerging data on it. Uh, and uh, our guidelines say just do AVD, six cycles of AV, A AVD and, and do radiotherapy. But we know that the outcomes are bad. And we also know that AVD is sometimes ch challenging for these patients and um, Therefore, we use the sequential approach of um, giving them brentuximab, two to four infusions, and then AVD, because then the disease gets less and the patients are fitter and they are able to tolerate AVD. And the, the outcomes are good. That's something that Andy Evans has published in the JCO. And you can consolidate uh, with brentuximab fiducin afterwards. And so this sequential BV AVD approach is something that we frequently use um, in the in the in the clinic. Um, so I meant uh, end stage renal disease or uh, CKD patient. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, sorry, I I, I misunderstood. Uh, so yeah, this is again challenging. Um, and uh, some most of the conventional chemotherapies are not uh, suitable. And um, that is, again, a case where we would uh, try to use uh, checkpoint inhibition, one or two doses to improve uh, the disease and also probably kidney function and then uh, be able to give chemotherapy afterwards, right? So um, the hope it would be to improve uh, 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 kidney function. If this is end-stage disease and it's not Hodgkin-related and they are on dialysis, you can even consider giving them uh, chemotherapy because you can't make it worse, right? And, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amit. Excellent, uh, Professor. I have two questions regarding early stage unfavorable disease. If a young patient, 25 years female, with a bulky mediastinal mass, given two cycles of AVVD plus two cycles of escalated BRCOP, is it still best to radiate that patient? Pet is negative after two AVVD plus two escalated BRCOP, two plus two. Yeah, so um, if we do 2 plus 2, we don't irradiate. So if they are PET negative after this, you don't need to irradiate. And um, you can spare them radiotherapy, if this though, was a question. Though it's a bulky medicinal mass still? Yes, um, yes, I know that, uh, especially in in, uh, in the US, uh, pay, uh, people are always worried about bulky mediastinal disease. But if they receive 2 plus 2 and they are PET negative, even with bulky disease, you don't need to irradiate. If you are in doubt and you don't really, the PET scan is borderline, I would always treat for the worse and then do radiotherapy. But if the PET scan is clean and you are sure about it and they have two plus two uh, and everything went away, you don't have to irradiate. Thank you, sir. And so, second question is, what is your take on upfront BB plus AVT for early stage unfavorable disease? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't show the data uh, since it's not it's not approved in this context, at least in Europe and 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 the US. And um, the data is limited to phase two trials, but we know that the combination is very effective. So four cycles of BVAVD can be very effective in this setting. And the Sloan Kettering colleagues, um, and I spent some time there myself, <laughs> actually, and and uh, we looked at, um, yeah how we need radiotherapy in these patients. And we know that most of these patients don't need radiotherapy. So if you have four cycles of BV, AVD, um, and there is a complete remission, I would also omit radiotherapy. And um, I think it's a very effective regimen. It's not approved in this setting and it's only phase two data. That's why I didn't show it, but it, you can use it as an alternative to two plus two. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Bal Krishna. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul, for the excellent lecture. I have two very basic questions. One is that um, in patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, once they are diagnosed, uh, would you automatically consider using uh, irradiated blood products? It was in the BCSH guidelines, and we used to use it that in the past, uh, with or without treatment. Uh, is it standard that we use a radiated blood product for all Hodgkin lymphoma? Yes. Uh, brief answer is yes. <laughs> So we do it in our center. Um, I don't know if it's really necessary, but just to be sure and also to account for any 
further treatments and transplantations and whatever happens down the road and immunotherapy, we do it, right? So uh, in our stand, uh, center, it's standard to use irradiated blood products. But I, I don't know any good data on it, right? So I, I can't uh, show you studies in Hodgkin lymphoma that justify doing it. I, I just can say we and also international centers, uh, I think, do it, yeah. Sure. And the second question that I have is that uh, nivolumab has very little lung toxicity. It says pneumonitis. We have not seen that in practice as well. Then why in all the trials, uh, bleomycin was dropped uh, with nivolumab? Yeah, I think it was uh, just a precaution, especially in the first line setting. You know you can cure these patients, right? If you treat them right, they are cured. So you don't want to risk the cure and therefore you don't want to introduce any toxicity that is unnecessary and this is why uh, we and other colleagues dropped the bleomycin from the trials i have not seen any combination to be honest i and i think it it could be feasible to combine it i don't think it's necessary because i think the effect of bleomycin is very limited in hodgkin lymphoma and um we have seen cases of pneumonitis with nivolumab, mostly in the solid cancer field, but also in Hodgkin lymphoma. And sometimes it's very severe pneumonitis, right? So patients are very sick and you need to treat with steroids and they need to be hospitalized. And it might even be refractory. And therefore, if you can do anything to omit it, to omit bleomycin and, and, and mitigate toxicity, I think it's worthwhile to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Dharma? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Paul. Thanks for lecture. And I have a query. This young patient, 21 year old, presenting with advanced and extensive liver infiltration. So, in the era of the Olavang and Bentoxin, how you approach a patient who comes with deep jaundice and high enzymes? Um, can you repeat the, 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 the specific problem? So what laboratory tests are elevated? Hodgkin presenting with the, the Hodgkin presenting with the, the liver involvement. Ah, liver. The hepatic yes. involvement. Sorry. Yes. Um, so if it's due to the disease, so th there is disease next to the liver or in the liver, then it will get better once you treat the disease. And then you need to uh, start treatment with something that is tolerable for the liver and in our experience uh, checkpoint based treatment is um, preferred over brentaximab based uh, treatment in this setting and similar to the case with HLA, HLH in the, uh, that we discussed before I think uh, doing something like one or two doses of single agent NDPD1 just to star treatment is worthwhile and then I would switch to regular chemotherapy um, something like uh, escalated Neocop or cut or uh, ABVD afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Asha, you want to ask your question? Is no, we can't. We can't still hear you. Okay, <laughs> sorry for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to type your question in the chat box? You can do that. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. How do you manage patients with Hodgkin lymphoma who are responding to nivolumab but who have developed skin rashes over hands and soles? Yes, so these immune-related immune side effects of, of NDPD1, they are of concern. If they are low grade, one or grade one or two, um, you can try to um, treat them with topical steroids, for example. Um, you can even delay nivolumab. You can maybe... Uh, reduce the dose, though there is no data for it. Um, but if the, the, the grade is higher, so grade three or four, you might have to discontinue nivolumab uh, completely and you need to treat with systemic steroids. And usually we use uh, a pulse of two milligram per kilogram body weight. And um, that is usually effective in getting rid of the rash or uh, any other complication that might be seen with nivolumab. And in my personal opinion, it's important to do it uh, because people tend not to do it because they are afraid of losing a response to nivolumab. And um, usually if you have these toxicities, it's a good sign. So uh, it's, it's a sign of response and um, you should not be afraid to use steroids to treat the side effect. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rohit. 
thank you professor for a wonderful talk thank you agarwal sir also for the invitation uh, my question is that uh, in patients living with uh, hiv infection hodgkins lymphoma advanced hodgkins lymphoma what are the potential issues with in treating them and what would you uh, prefer would you be comfortable in using dv immunotherapy etc in patients living with hiv yeah. Yes, a very good question. I also didn't uh, talk about this because of time, but um, uh, what's important is to uh, treat the HIV. So you should start them on antiretroviral therapy um, as soon as uh, as they are diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, the latest. And you should simultaneously start treatment in the Hodgkin lymphoma. And you can use ABVD, you can use BIACOP baseline, an escalated BIACOP might be tricky because it's very intensive and patients might not tolerate well. In my personal experience and also from our trials, we know that you can use brentaximab and um, uh, NTPD1 in combination with AVD. So I think that's safe to use. Um, but the most important point is to um, start treating the HIV and consider a prophylaxis for viral or uh, fungal or uh, bacterial infections. Yeah. I wouldn't do escalated BIACOP in an HIV-positive patient, especially if the HIV is uncontrolled. Um, I would feel comfortable, and I think it's okay to use BVAVD or um, uh, NEVO-AVD or something like this. Yeah. Thank you. Powder. Uh can I know your views about uh, treating a patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma in pregnancy? So second trimester, third trimester, pregnant woman presenting with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah, that's very challenging. <laughs> it sometimes happens. We had a case just last week, I think. And um, uh, if you can delay treatment, you should delay treatment because sometimes Hodgkin's lymphoma is not as aggressive as you fear, so you just can monitor the patients by ultrasound or whatever, or MR, MRI, and um, just wait for the fetus to, to get older. And if the fetus is old enough, you can try to, to get the child by cesarean section, for example, and start treatment afterwards. Um, if this is not feasible and you need to treat because the patient is very sick, um, you need you might consider some preface with dexamethasone, for example, and then um, I think AVD chemotherapy is quite safe. There's some data on it. Um, the later you do it, the better for the, okay. the fetal health. Um, if the pregnancy is very, very, very early, you might even consider just treating the Hodgkin lymphoma to save the mother and um, and uh, yeah, disregard the pregnancy. But uh it's a very challenging situation to be honest and um we do this on a case to case basis we don't have any any guidelines for this um, yeah. okay thank you very much but uh, you just to add on this sorry just to add on this um uh, so if this is a third trimester and the, the, the fetus is well developed you might consider getting the child early by cesarean section for example and then start treatment afterwards i think that's an important point because you don't need to expose uh, the fetus to chemotherapy if it's well developed and you, you can get it uh, several weeks early. I think that's, uh, that's, that's important to keep in mind. Yes, yes. thank you so much. <coughs> Parthiv, you have a question? Yes, sir. So my question is, uh, do you see any future to omit chemotherapy? And instead of chemotherapy, you give a uh, checkpoint inhibitor as well as uh, brentuximab in advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so as a first-line treatment, I don't think that this is something we would do. We know from the data of BV um, NIVO, for example, it's not as effective as you would hope, right? And um, if you can give AVD, and AVD can be given to most patients, I would combine checkpoint inhibition with AVD because I think it's more effective than brentaximab and, uh, and nivolumab, for example, as a first-line treatment. And if you cannot do it because the patient is very sick or has liver disease or whatever, I would um, give NTPD1 as a monotherapy, one or two doses, see if the patient gets fitter, and then start normal treatment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Pauna? No, I, I've finished my question. Thank you. 
from the chat box, Dr. Kanan has a question. Stage 2B disease received two cycles of ABVD. Entering PET is negative. Can I use four more AVD and not use radiotherapy at all? Uh, yes. So the, the short answer is, I think, yes, you can do that. Um, we don't, again, have any good data on it um, because all the trials looked at different chemo sequences. But uh, from Russell, we know that you don't need to continue with ABVD. So you can go to AVD in patients that are PET negative. I didn't show the data, but I think it's important data. And you can also spare the patient radiotherapy. So if you have a complete remission after two cycles of ABVD, you can do four, four more cycles of AVD and not do radiotherapy. I think that's fine. Thank you. Dr. Asha Shah's question was, which among the newer agents would you prefer for treating Hodgkin in an elderly person with chronic liver disease? Yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, and I, we have discussed this, I think, one or two times now. And I, um, as I said, for me personally, or our, our best experience is um, with the checkpoint inhibitors. I mean, it's keep coming back, but the, the, they are very tolerable. They, they are not uh, metabolized in the liver. You can use them in, in liver or kidney failure. And that's why uh, they are the preferred agents to, to go to as a monotherapy, but you could also uh, combine them with some sort of abbreviated chemotherapy. Uh, Dr. Paul, efficacy-wise, how do you compare Rentuximab versus Checkpoint? Yeah, we know from the relapse setting, and I briefly showed this slide from Keynote 204, that the Checkpoint inhibitors are more effective in terms of PFS and overall survival. The remission rates are quite similar, um, and therefore our personal um, first choice usually is the checkpoint inhibitor. And this is also how the approval was changed in Europe and, uh, and Germany. So um, if there's relapse, you would use uh, the checkpoint inhibitor first. And only if this fails, we would use Brentaxima Fidotin. The post uh, autologous transplant setting, this one year of Brentuximab, now do you replace it with the checkpoint? Uh, we don't do it. Um, I know there's a small phase two trial from uh, Philippe Amont from, from the US, from Dana Faber. And um, I talked to him a lot about this because I think it's very important and interesting to do. Uh, there's no company or no money to do a trial in this setting. So we don't, we'll, we will not have an answer on it. Um, the way I understand the biology, I think checkpoint inhibitor might not be as effective right after high dose chemotherapy. And therefore, I still do Brentaxamac with dotin consolidation. I use the checkpoint inhibitors mostly before uh, high-dose chemotherapy, right? So just as a savage treatment, for example, to get a remission and then go to um, go to transplant. And after transplant, I would use brentaximab bidotin. Yeah, because the data is quite good. You don't need to, do, to give 16 infusions. I think if you can give eight or 10 or something, that's fine. Um, but uh, I would consider this as a, as a standard treatment. And as a bridge to transplant between the three options, what's your preferred option? Chemo or Brentuximab plus chemo or CPI plus chemo? Yeah, so the approval and reimbursement in Germany only allows us to do chemo. So we use DHUB mostly. Sometimes we use ICE or IGEF. Um, that's what we usually do. We know that the combination of NTPD1 and chemotherapy, such as Nevo ice or PGVD, is something that is very effective and likely much better than just chemotherapy. And if it's a young fit patient, I want to bridge to transplant, I try to get funding uh, for the checkpoint chemo combination. So PEMPRO, GVD, or Nevo ice. No place for brain toximab? Uh, not for me, uh, no. <laughs> Um, some patients had it in the first line with BRCAD or with uh, BVAVD, so there's no sense in re-exposing them so shortly after. And efficacy-wise, the, 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 the NTP1-based combinations are much more effective, and therefore I would go for them. And uh, <clears throat> does AVD, AAVD replace ABVD in the frontline newly diagnosed advanced yeah. ABVD? So we don't do it in Germany because for us, um, escalated BRCOP is standard of care and it, it's a very it, it, specific German situation. Um, 
internationally, I would say it, it has replaced ABVD. Um, but now with the data for Nevo AVD, I, I think it will very soon be replaced again. And it's not in the NCCN guidelines yet, but I know from, from, from Alex Herrera and his and his colleagues that they intend to include it towards the end of the year. And then we will have, uh, I think, Nevo AVD based first line treatment as an alternative to um, to Brecard, so our um, modified beer cup regimen uh, with Brempaxima. So these are the two options. And in Germany, we will likely do a Brecard in a pet adapted fashion because we want to treat patients with four cycles whenever possible instead of, of six cycles. And with both BVAVD and Nevo AVD, you have to give six cycles, right? This is not pet adapted. And therefore, um, it's a good option if you don't have PET scan and if you don't want to get if intensive chemotherapy, but in my personal opinion, if you have PET scan and have, have good supportive care, you can um, you can do BCOP or you can do uh, uh, Brecard, uh, and it's more effective. And therefore, it will remain our standard of care, and I think many European colleagues will will also do it, um, and we will use the the chemo, the checkpoint inhibitors in in the second line treatment mostly. Okay. There are two questions outside your lecture. What is on? Uh... Uh, nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin lymphoma stage two. What is your preferred treatment option? Yeah, so in uh, NLPHL, you can do watch and wait as an indolent lymphoma. You just treat if it's needed. And if you re require treatment, we treat it as a classical Hodgkin lymphoma, at least in Germany. So we would use ABVD. I know internationally people also use CHOP, for example. And I think radiotherapy is very important in this disease. So if you uh, can use consolidative radiotherapy, you should do it because um, you can um, pro prolong progression free survival for several years. And, and therefore I would, um, if it's just stage 2A, for example, without risk factors, I would just do two cycles of ABVD followed by 20 gray radiotherapy. Yeah. Thank you. Last question is more on diagnostics. It's to differentiate all negative ALCL versus Hodgkin. And she's put up ALK, a yeah. ALK negative ALCL from Hodgkin. And there is a package of markers put up there. Yeah. Take this question. <laughs> yeah, I get the question and it's very complex. I think it's the most common misdiagnosis in both directions. So Hodgkin uh, misdiagnosed as T-cell lymphoma and the other way around. It's very challenging. You need to have a good pathologist because I think the marker panel is one thing, but the morphology and the composition of the tumor, this is what is more important because the this is very distinct. And usually you can recognize the Hodgkin lymphoma morphology based on the H and E slide. And this is something that is uh, important to keep in mind um, and is something that uh, to my Experience is even more important than the marker panel in this setting. Thank you. Dr. Raghavendra, your question. Um, so I'm a radiation oncologist from Solapur Cancer Center. Solapur, it's a, that was a very nice talk, sir, from your side. I just want to understand if a stereotactic radiosurgery to a small volume of malignant lymph node, if given, the rupture of malignant cells can, can occur, occur, and uh, that can release antigens which could induce immuno immunologic response. Uh, could that be equivalent to nivolumab therapy? Like? Yes, um, thank you very much. And I think you also posted something to this in the chat. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. Um, and uh, something that we have done a clinical trial on. I will briefly share my screen just for those that are still there and interested. <laughs> um, and you can then see that uh, we are uh, doing this in the urn trial. It's in German. I'm very sorry because it's a backup slide. But what you are referring to is that you radiate a tumor and this tumor releases antigen and thereby you are priming the immune system. And you can combine this with antibodies uh, against NTPD1 to prime the immune system and have an effect in non irradiated lesions. And that's something that we actually did in a trial. It's quite interesting because we uh, could show that uh, this is individual patients that not only the radiotherapy target lesions shown in orange are uh, decreasing in size, but non-irradiated lesions are decreasing as well. And 
to me, this is very indicative of some, something that is called the epicopal effect. And um, I think uh, radiotherapy to a single lesion uh, can be very helpful in Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, yeah, you can you use this um, as, a, as, a, as a concept. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I need to get rid of the sharing. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, some more questions are coming in the chat box. Dr. Suresh wants to know, can dexamethasone 40 mg and Pembro be given simultaneously in uh, PEM GVD? Sorry, what did, uh, Dexa for TMG? What what does TMG with, stand for? Together with pembrolizumab. Yeah. In a protocol like pembrolizumab with GVD. Yeah. So um, you should try to reduce the exposure to Dexa and and, and prednisolone to a minimum. If you have to administer prednisolone and dexamethasone to something. Uh, to another condition, you can do it simultaneously. And in my personal experience, it does not affect the efficacy of Pembro GVD. So the NTPD1 antibody is so effective that uh, some dose of steroids does not really uh, limit it, it, its efficacy. Thank you. Dr. Nidhi has a question. How do you sequence the salvage regimen in an early relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma She's put a situation, do you consider combination of immunotherapy with chemo versus rentuximab with chemo or only conventional chemo for patients yes. who received ABVD upfront? Yes, so I think this is similar to what you have asked before and um, uh, my personal experience and preference is for um, checkpoint inhibition in combination with chemo. And... Um, I would personally like the Pembro GVD regimen because it's easy to administer and, and we do it a lot, but you can also do Nevo Ice or, or um, other combinations. But chemo plus checkpoint inhibitor is something that is usually doing a good job in those patients. Thank you. Uh, there's a question. In sub-Saharan Africa, tuberculosis is very prevalent. Sometimes there is interaction between Hodgkin and tuberculosis, and this can be bidirectional. Does this affect management plan in case both happen to be at the same time or one after the other? This is a question from Ethiopia. Yeah, um, a very good question, a very challenging situation. Uh, fortunately, we don't have it that much in Germany, but I know other countries uh, have these problems. Um, I, I would treat what what kills first, right? So if the Hodgkin lymphoma is very aggressive and you need to treat it, you should start with the Hodgkin lymphoma treatment. If the tuberculosis is disseminated and the patient is very sick, you should start with the, the tuberculosis treatment. Doing it all together, tuberculosis and Hodgkin lymphoma treatment simultaneously can be challenging because the, the, the tuberculosis medicaments, uh, drugs, they have a lot of interaction potential with the chemo and other agents. And um, I would try to sequence it in a way. And if this is possible, um, and especially uh, usually, yeah, usually uh, you can try to get the tuberculosis into some sort of remission uh, with a brief course of antibiotics and then try to have some maintenance and during maintenance you can treat the Hodgkin lymphoma. But if Hodgkin lymphoma is very aggressive, um, you might want to st start treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma, use something that is very short. So for example, dose dense ABVD or, or BRCOP and, and try to get rid of, of, of the Hodgkin lymphoma as soon as possible. But yeah, it's a challenging situation because patients are very sick and um, you have a lot of complications and, and interactions. One more question has come up from Dr. Nikhil. Role of NEVO in interim PET positive stage 2 be unfavorable Hodgkin and your experience about cardiac toxicity from NEVO. Yeah, so um, if patients are uh, basically refractory to first-line treatment or don't respond as expected, we are, in, in my opinion, in the setting of a second-line treatment and then there is a role for um, checkpoint inhibitor-based 
salvage treatment such as PGVD or NICE. And um, if the patient is responding and there is some residual pet activity, I would simply continue with first line treatment and uh, uh, see if this remission is durable. The cardiac toxicity of, of NTPD1 antibodies is something that is very um, potentially dangerous, but it's very rare, extremely rare, so less than 1%. And um, uh, something that you usually recognize because patients have uh, cardiac um, dysfunction, they might have uh, 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 yeah symptoms of a heart attack even. And um, that is something that uh, we have only seen in Hodgkin lymphoma patients. I've never seen it, but in other solid cancer patients, I have seen it before. Thank you. So that was the last question in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Paul, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning. So much time we devoted the lecture followed by so many questions and you patiently answered all of them to the satisfaction of each one of us. Grateful to you for this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and hosting me. I think it's very interesting to share our experiences. And um, yeah, thank you for joining me. And I'm very much looking forward to visiting uh, you in person uh, next year. And if there's any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out via email. And um, yeah, looking forward to see you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.